Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your abstract hosts. I am John. And I'm CC. And when there's just too much cool anime to watch, we got you covered. Today everything comes full circle here on Anime Brain Freeze. First I'll talk about the latest mind-bending artsy output from writer slash director Kunihiko Ikahara, Sara Zanmai. A series about circles, balls and the adventures of three kappa boys in their search for human connection. And then we will go back to the very beginning of our little podcast by talking about the second season of the first show we ever reviewed, One Punch Man. Can the second season hold a candle to its predecessor? Well, stay tuned to find out, but first, sadly, we have to cover some bad news in the world of anime that happened last week. Yeah, so, um, last Thursday morning, a tragic event occurred in Kyoto, Japan, where 34 people working at Kyoto Animation lost their lives in a senseless act of violence. I want to start by maybe addressing the perpetrator of this crime. I don't have kind words for you. I can only say I don't want to know your name, and I don't want to know why you did what you did. I hope that you gain no infamy from this. I hope that you aren't put to death. I hope that you're left to rot in your jail cell, and that you fade from history and are forgotten. That out of the way, because I don't, I don't want to focus on the bad. I want to focus on the good. Yes. But it's hard to you know focus on the good without first addressing what did happen because what happened last week is nothing short of appalling yeah it's a tragedy and I, and I think a lot of other people have stated better than what I personally can what an incredible loss this is because in addition to the human cost nearly all of the work at Kyoto Animation Studio One was lost anything that was in progress or from past works basically an entire living archive was lost to this egregious act People and the work they did, the stuff they created, like basically part of their lives were just eradicated. It's a nightmare. I mean, I mean for either of us who are an ocean or a giant landmass, you know, because we both live in different parts of the world, uh, away from this incident, it feels weird to describe how, <clears throat> how heartbroken I, I feel about this. I'm sure you do as well. Sure. Because me and Kyoani's works, no matter how fantastical or whimsical they are, always have this profound human element to them. Something that I believe was, you know, like a very deliberate choice when they were choosing what they were adapting. All of, because all of their shows are so, all of their shows and movies are so painstakingly crafted and just amazingly well realized. Kyoani is also something of an outlier in the Japanese animation industry because they employ a disproportionately large amount of women compared to other studios, which kind of helps to bring a much-needed balance and added perspective to an industry that most definitely sorely needs it. Their workers are all salaried rather than freelancers, which enables them to focus on the quality of their work rather than having to meet a certain quota. And they also have a much healthier work-life balance because, like, I did some reading on this. Like, they even have, like, maternity leave and things like that, which is great, which is how it should be. Mm -hmm. I guess more than anything else, what I'm trying to say is that Kyoto Animation is an amazingly progressive company in a field of work that, you know, again, really needs this sort of uh, mindset. I want to remember them for that. And the enjoyment that they brought to people around the world. Yeah, which is immense. A lot of a lot of people have like poured out their sympathy uh, sympathy in the wake of this tragedy, and have done their darndest to uh, contribute in some way to ease the uh, the pain of the people left behind and to find some to make up for some of that in some form or another. There, there was a fundraiser set up, I think. Uh, yeah. On Kiona's side. Kiona's side that you can still donate to, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I, I'm, I'm think I'm going to put that in the in the episode description, so you can just follow the URL there if you want to give some money. That would be nice. I think some of the work. I'm going a little off my script here, but uh, sure. I think some of the work was actually spared because of some key frames were in a museum. I forget which one. So yeah, I mean, there's a little bit of stuff that was, you know, 
at least spared from this. But yeah, um, you know, these 34 talented artists who were trying to deliver their <clears throat> their creative vision to us, you know, they're gone forever now. The legacy of those who remain is in tatters. But, you know, rather than being sad about that, it's important to celebrate their achievements and their creations. And it's important to share what your favorite work of theirs is. And it's important to keep everything that encompasses what... Uh, <clears throat> what Kiwani is in, uh, in your hearts. You know, there are other bigger, more prestigious Anitubers <laughs> than us, like, for instance, Gigik and Jeff Thu, who have said that anime is something that crosses barriers like borders, cultures, and language. And I want to, you know, echo that here because. Kiwani's enduring body of work is most certainly a testament to that sentiment. I guess to close this, to close out my piece, I want to say, if you feel like this has affected you in any way, uh, CC just said, you know, there are different ways you can donate. Uh, Sentai Filmworks, who are ostensibly Kiwani West. Uh, set up a GoFundMe that you can donate to. Last I looked at, it was edging up on two and a half million dollars, which is, which is great. That's yeah. amazing. Um, you can donate to them directly. Uh, they put up uh, donation info on their website, and some people have taken to translating it. Uh, I'm gonna try and find that translated info and pass it along to you, so we can put it in the description. Uh, there's even a page they have on their site where you can buy super high quality digital prints, like 4K high quality that are beautiful. I, I bought a few of them uh, myself, um, and that goes again directly into their pockets as well. You can also support them by watching an episode or two of their shows or one of their movies on a legal streaming site. You buy their Blu-rays or DVDs. I uh, went to Sentai Filmworks site and bought a few things myself to add to my collection. But, you know, that's just a few of the ways you can honor and support them, and I think it's important to do so. Yeah, go celebrate the stuff you only put out. <laughs> we we got, we had reviewed like two shows of theirs on our podcast that we mm. both really much enjoyed. Sound Euphonium and uh, Dragon Maid. And if you want anything to know where to start <laughs> with those are good places to start those are good places to start and uh, i think you'll at least enjoy some of that and uh yeah maybe maybe uh this helps you realize what incredible incredible loss this is and uh we don't want to reduce those people and the lives lost just to their work that's not our intention mm. uh we just want to express how we were able through to connect to those people through their creative output, which makes the the loss of lives and the loss of those people more makes it feel closer than it often is during those kinds of tragedies because there are many people dying all over the world every day mm. and horrible, horrible things happening. And a lot of those that you hear on the news and you're just like, well, that's another shit day down the drain. And then you pa put that past you and you, you know, you blend it out. And that's okay because you have to go on with your own lives, right? You can't mm -hmm. just linger on every tragedy that's happening in the world because it will break you eventually if you put, try to put your entire, uh, pour your entire empathy into that. But, in, you know, in cases like that where you have not personally met these kinds of people, because the people you personally meet are always more inherently more tragic to you when they're lost you, that just can't be helped that is an emotional <laughs> baseline and emotional truth but uh you know when when you have connected to these people be it only by proxy through their work and their creative output because a lot of not uh, maybe not all of them but a lot of creative people pour their heart and soul into their work and or you can at least find a bit of their person of their soul in their work and if you have watched that stuff, if, if you watch Kyo Ani's stuff, you can already tell there's a lot of passion behind that, a lot of talent, a lot of 
heart and soul in those works. And that makes you help feel and realize more what has happened here and what has been lost than maybe in some other cases. So yeah, that's why we wanted to talk about this. That's why we want to bring this forth. Uh, we don't really want to go into the details of anything like John said. If you are interested in that, there are enough news sites that cover that. We just wanted to talk about this from an emotional standpoint and what this means to us and how we feel about that, because that's all we can do besides, you know, contributing to the fundraiser and trying to help out in ways. But uh, yeah, that's something horrible, something truly tragic that happened here. And the repercussions of this will be felt for a long time to come in the anime, not only in the anime community, but definitely in the anime community. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we, we, I hope, we hope that um, Kyo Ani and everyone involved in this can in some way or another recover from this and get past this uh, this horrible thing. Through a number of unfortunate circumstances, the three middle school students, Kazuki, Enta and Toi, break the Kappa statue of the guardian god of Tokyo's Asakusa district. The self-proclaimed prince of the Kappa kingdom, introducing himself by the name of Kepi, is so enraged by this that he forcefully takes away the three boys Shirikodama, a mythical organ that is part of the makeup of a human soul. After losing their Shirikodama, the boys are transformed into Kappa themselves. Cappy tells them the only way to return to their previous lives is to steal some Shirikodama themselves from the bodies of so-called Kappa zombies. After obtaining and refining the mystic spheres, Cappy can transform the Shirikodama into dishes of hope that are able to grant any wish. But to refine the Shirikodama, the three boys have to perform the Sara Zanmai, a link of mind and soul that might expose secrets to each other that the trio would rather keep to themselves. But who is creating the Kappa zombies in the first place? Will the boys be able to gather enough dishes of hope to satisfy their personal desires? And can they form a connection strong enough to withstand the strain the secrets revealed by the Sara Zanmai are putting on their relationship? So. Sara Zanmai is, like I already alluded to in the, the intro, is the brainchild of writer and director Kunihiko Ikuhara. Besides this TV series, he has also wrote a one-volume spin-off manga uh, and a Sara Zanmai light novel. Now, if you haven't heard his name before, although I think we have mentioned him at least in passing before, he I'm made his sure we have, yeah, yeah. Um, but he made his big splash as a director on Sailor Moon up until uh, its fourth series, Super S, I think. So he did normal Sailor Moon, uh, Sailor Moon R, uh, the R movie as well, I think, uh, Sailor Moon S and Super S, at least as a director. Sometimes also as a serious composer, I think, and storyboard artist. But his most prolific work came probably after that in the form of Revolutionary Girl Utena, um, the series and the movie, which is still heralded as one of those transformative anime works, uh, like in the same vein as Neon Genesis Evangelion, I guess, uh, especially for young girls who watched it while growing up. He also wrote and directed Penguin Drum, and four years ago he was a director and series composer on Yurikuma Arashi, he has done very few small things in between, uh, but those I mentioned are his hallmarks. So he seems to be this auteurish director who has a very clear vision for his projects from beginning to end and also a very tight grasp on what that project is supposed to be. Like he has, <laughs> he is, he has the reins in his hands. He's at the steering wheel and he has always very specific things to say in those projects. And Sara Zanma is no exception. Uh, he was aided on the series by chief director Nobuyuki Takeuchi, who also worked on the Monogatari series, Utena, Lyrical Nanoha, and Penguin Drum. And also uh, he had a co-writer 
on this show in the form of Teruko Utsumi, who also worked on the production of Princess Jellyfish and Durarara and wrote scripts for Kakaguri, Dance with the Devils and Cheer Boys. The music is done by uh, Yukari Hashimoto, who also worked on Toradora, Osomatsu-san, and of course Penguin Drum and Yuri Kuma Arashi again, so also uh, an Ikuhara familiar at this point. <laughs> and this series was animated by Studio Mappa, which we have already mentioned in our previous episode when talking about Dororo. So I won't run down their bio again, <laughs> which we probably do too often, considering we have long-time uh, listeners who are at this point probably sick uh, uh, of us reciting the like production credits of certain studios. But then again, bear with us, because each episode could be a new listener's first episode. So there you go. Suffice to say... This is the best-looking series MAPPA have produced ever, in my opinion. This is a super colorful, fluid, snappy-looking production that has a very high and very consistent level of animation quality. Mind you, it's probably also the most cartoony that MAPPA ever went. I mean, I don't know about TQ. I assume that it's very cartoony as well. John, you watched that, so... Well, TQ is... A... The legend is its own beast altogether. Okay. <laughs> But but it's probably more cartoony than something like Dororo or uh, Yuri on Ice or something, I assume. Well, by virtue of its source material, yes, it is. Okay. So, yeah, so, Sarah Zalma is more in that vein. And from what I've seen of their stuff, this is like the most cartoony, fun, colorful, varied and interesting looking stuff they have done. And like I said, it is super consistent from beginning to end. There were passionate people working on this that never phoned it in and apparently had enough time and motivation to realize Ikuhara's vision without taking shortcuts, and that's great. Now, <laughs> if you have never seen a show of the Ikuhara brand, if you want to call it that, um, the first episode of this alone will probably weird you the fuck out. Because Kuniko Ikuhara employs a very surreal and abstract style of direction, imagery, and of storytelling in pretty much all of his big works. Like, imagine the most surreal, artsy, weird, non-sequitur arrangement of scenes, theme presentation, and story beats you can think of, and I'll wager that Ikuhara will still manage to outdo that in at least one scene in this show. Now, granted, Sarazanmai is the first show of his that I have watched to completion, but judging from what I've seen, of his other stuff, a few episodes of Penguin Drum and Yuri Kuma, as well as some clips and reviews of Utena, this is definitely his thing. Now, that also means that his stuff can be very challenging to watch, especially if you are more used to or even prefer a classic straightforward narrative. And don't get me wrong, there's definitely a narrative here, but it is often buried under a plethora of visual metaphors, a myriad of subtextual themes, obtuse puns and wordplays, at least if you don't speak Japanese, which I don't, a bunch of seemingly random comedic bits and a lot of queer imagery. Um, Ikuhara has always put a lot of queer stuff in his works, from what I can tell, but while at least Utena and Yuri Kuma are more focused on the Yuri end of things, Sarazanma is definitely more in the male-oriented BL section. It can be found everywhere in this series, from the relationship between the three main characters and our main two antagonists to the visual style of the Kappa zombies and how the Shirikodama are extracted from people's bodies, which in case you didn't already guess it, is through their butts. And this is not some hinted at procedure. Even though presented in a very visually abstract way and in a very colorful style, it's a very graphic display of three Kappa boys diving into the ass of a giant weird zombie creature and pulling out a giant sphere. While they do that, we get a side shot that makes them look like anal beads. Oh. <laughs> and when they finally pull the Shiri Kodama out, there is a lot of anal leakage. Again, mm. colors and designs are abstracted, so it looks too cartoony and unrealistic to be gross or anything, but you definitely get the idea what is going on here. And yeah, Kappa, in case you are not familiar with them, are these weird duck slash frog slash turtle creatures from classic Japanese folklore that live in the rivers. And if you get too close to them, they will extract your soul through your anus. So you see, the series is consistent in how it integrated that part of the myth. 
Another big thing in Ikurahara's works is uh, they often feel like stage plays or musicals. And that is very prevalent in the series as well. Uh, we got at least two big musical numbers in every episode. Those two acts don't really change much. A few lyrics adjustments aside here and there to match, you know, each episode's theme. And they are repeated in every episode. So maybe for some of you, they will get old after a while. But I found the presentation so weird and interesting to look at that I didn't tire of it. So the first musical act is when the two otter cops, because the arch enemy of the Kappa is the Otter Empire, of course. When those two guys named Ryo and uh, Mabu turn people into Kappa zombies by extracting their desires from their bodies, they do it by shooting them with a special gun and then performing a special dance number. And the second musical act is the actual fight of the three protagonists against said zombie. Uh, so they basically sing a song, transform into this weird shuriken thing to blast through the zombie's attacks, get behind it, and then pull the shir shirikodama out, which is then followed by the actual Zarazanmai, wherein the boys transform back into their human bodies while surfing naked through a giant tunnel of water and performing a dance as well at the same time. <laughs> So if I haven't made it clear at this point, this is a very weird show. It is somewhat grounded by being set in our world, partly. Uh, you know, it's set in Tokyo, but it can be incredibly surreal at times. But that's what makes it so great. There's so much weird artsy stuff to look uh, at, and you're constantly thrown between the three states of mind, like, oh god, what is happening? And wow, I've never seen this before. And okay, what the hell is the meaning of this? <laughs> <laughs> what am I looking at? <laughs> uh, and if you can get over some of the possibly gross imagery in there, like I said, it never was for me. But if some of you uh, of that irks you, I think it, it's worth seeing past that because it can be an incredibly gorgeous show. Now, when it comes to all the metaphors, the analogies and making sense of the actual story, I'd say it definitely helps if you have a knack for deciphering those things. If the entire uh, entire first like one or two episodes feel like completely unrelated nonsense to you, you might not get that much enjoyment out of the series all on your own. You will definitely get a lot more out of it if you know your way around certain themes and visual or filmic language and know how to read between the lines because there's a lot of stuff jammed between the lines here. Hell, the main villain of the show outright states that he's just an abstract concept, so you get the idea. <clears throat> As for myself, while I'm not adverse to looking at certain imagery and, you know, find some hidden meaning behind it, I'm also incredibly bad at it. And even then, I gotta say, I really enjoyed the story of Sarah Zanmai from beginning to end. Yes, there's a lot of obtuse and abstract stuff thrown in there, that is hard to make sense of without some background info on Japanese language or folklore, or at least by rewatching certain scenes again. But I think the core themes and story beats of the series are simple and strong enough to form a coherent statement at the end and give you some emotionally rewarding moments throughout the whole show. Regardless, if you are afraid you're missing out on some of the stuff in the show by not being able to like see through all the stuff that Ikohara is throwing at you, there are definitely some reviews out there on the net that go in depth on all the stuff and symbolism that is in that show. I can recommend like the episode reviews uh, for the show on ANN. There are only eight. They haven't done all 11. I don't know if the rest is coming, but the first eight already will fill you in on a lot of stuff that might have gone over your head. So I definitely recommend that. I will link that in the uh, episode des uh, description as well. But yeah, without giving too much away, all this show basically is, is a meditation on human connection. Um, what are the different ways we connect in today's society? What is most important when forming a connection with other people? What are the obstacles? What are the pitfalls? Um, what can destroy a connection? What can force a person out of societal circles or make them exclude themselves from the circles of friends and family? And some of the metaphors used to underline that theme of connection are super obvious. For example, when Kazuki, Enta and Toei perform the Zara Zanmai, a Wi-Fi symbol appears on their heads. Uh, <laughs> the, 
the characters often carry around paper boxes uh, with them, bearing the text Kappazon Prime, of course. And these boxes are something that Ikuhara loves uh, to use to visualize um, society's attempt to force us as people to put our desires and wishes, or our whole lives for that matter, into small little boxes and folders that they don't really fit into or belong into to adhere to societal norms and standards. And we have most of the random pedestrians in the show, like pedestrians on the street that are unimportant to the story, are just gray, simple silhouettes, like something you might find on a public bathroom stall or something. And I definitely had seen that in Penguin Drum before. So, you know, little stuff like that. Each episode title, which uh, are displayed at the end of each episode in this case, begins with the phrase, I want to connect but, and then is followed by something that makes immediate sense in relation to each given episode. Like, I want to connect, but I want to lie. I want to connect, but I can't be forgiven. I want to connect, but you're so far away. So a lot of this stuff is not as heavy or obtuse as you might expect it to be, and is consistent enough for each episode and throughout the series that it even helps you making sense of what is going on in the story and in the characters' minds, even when a lot of the stuff shown on screen is inherently absurd. And I really like that. I think that it's a great idea to go about this stuff and to, to go about telling a story, and it's really different and unusual, and you, don't, you really don't see it that often, at least not in anime, in my opinion. Now, when it comes to our main trio, um, they are all very interesting characters by themselves already, but their in individual stories become even more interesting when it comes to the connection between each other and their family members. Kazuki, for example, has a little brother that he is struggling to connect to the older he gets and the more he is supposed to adhere to a classic male role model. He even builds a fake social media relationship with his brother Haruka by cross-dressing as the idol of the city, Azuma Sara. Uh, that his brother is a giant fan of. Nothing is going to go wrong there, of course. Mm. <clears throat> and there is also some history between them that later shows you that those endeavors are not entirely altruistic at all <laughs> from Kazuki's side of things. So yeah, big drama. Enta, on the other hand, is in love with Kazuki, but can neither confess that to his friend nor to himself, really. Instead, his desires make him often linger in daydreams where he imagines him and Kazuki connecting through their favorite hobby, soccer, again, and then becoming fated lovers. And last but not least, there is Toei, who has a giant piece of baggage in his life, in the f also in the form of a brother, his big brother, Chikai, who he really loves, but who has become a stone-cold criminal and whose favorite motto is only bad people survive in this world. Which naturally, Toei tries to adapt into his own life to connect with his brother, and you can imagine that leads to a plethora of horrible clusterfucks as well. And yeah, all these characters have something incredibly relatable to them. All their problems are very human and heartfelt in nature and plucked straight from reality. They are not always likable, because they make some really bad and selfish decisions throughout the story, but that makes them trying to break out of their own personal vicious cycles so much more emotionally rewarding, in my opinion. I really like this main trio of characters and their journey of connection, self-realization and self-actualization in this series. Our antagonists don't fare as well, in my opinion. <laughs> the mystery mm -hmm. behind Rios and Mabu's relationship is not bad, but they needed some extra standalone episodes that prominently featured them alone and their issues to make me really connect ha, to their personal story. Cappy and Azuma Sara are also kind of important to the story in terms of basic plot, but they were mostly in there for comedic purposes to move the plot along or fill you in on the story and themes by throwing some metaphors at you. There's not much character development to them, if at all, so they are mostly in there as support for the main characters. And yeah, I really don't want to give any more away in terms of where the story and the character development goes, because I think that is the most interesting stuff in the show. But if you need some incentive to make it to the end, I, I was very happy how the show wrapped up the three main character story arcs. It felt consistent. It had a bittersweet and heartwarming note to it, which I always appreciate. And by the end, some interesting and important things have been said 
that you might very well be able to apply to your own life as well. So it was very rewarding in that regard as well. I would have appreciated it if we had spent a bit more time with each character, especially the antagonists, because it can sometimes feel like the show is rushing from plot point to plot point to get where it wants to go and to bring the messages across it wants to bring across. But since this show has only 11 episodes, which is an unusual number, I mm. feel like this was the exact episode number Ikuharu had in mind and the exact amount of story uh, he wanted to tell and the er er exact amount of time he wanted to spend on that story. So who am I to tell him <laughs> that the series would have profited from a higher episode count? Maybe it wouldn't have. And yeah... I know this is a super short review, kind of, but a lot of the stuff goes into details and spoilers, and that's why I'm keeping it short. I recommend this show to anyone who wants to watch something truly original and different from your standard anime stories, tropes, and visuals, and who is not easily put off by some really weird stuff. Uh, in the US, you can watch the show on Crunchyroll on, or Funimation. In Germany, it's available on Anime On Demand. I think it's definitely worth checking out. I really like the story, characters, and themes the show was going for and going with. And it's just really different from most things I've seen in recent seasons. And it will probably be a while till we get something like this again, if at all. All right, so it's time to go back, back to the past. To the beginning. The very beginning, the beginning of all anime. Before this, there was no other. And the right. end? Yeah. The alpha and the omega? Hmm. Well, you know, hopefully not, hopefully not the omega because, well, we'll talk about it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so... Yes, we're going back to our very roots to talk about the glorious return mm. of One Punch Man. So, what's One Punch Man about? Of course, it's about Saitama. Saitama is a hero for fun. And only that, no. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Saitama is a young man who, after three years of special training, I think was it 100 push-ups, 100 sit-ups, and a 10-kilometer run per each day. day. Yes. Each, each and every day. He somehow now has this unnatural strength there that he is pretty close to just being invincible. Uh, he can beat all of his opponents in one punch. So far, Man. he <laughs> Go on. So far, so far, he has been pretty much invincible. Like, nothing has been able to really even touch him. Like, he didn't... And if it, they were able to touch him, it was because he didn't put in any effort into evading them or deflecting the attacks or whatever. Like, so far, he's only done normal punches. Uh, yeah. And, you know... Uh. Just swaying a bit here and there, but not really crazy acrobatics or anything. He doesn't have to. He's just so fucking OP. OP, man. Uh, but, yeah. Hey. Yeah, hey. <laughs> man, this is a pun-heavy episode. Uh, but, yeah. Um, we're going to go into full spoilers here. Because this is a continued series review. Just as a warning. But, yeah, John. Please continue. What? What? I mean, I don't know what, if you w already want to go there or if you want to go a bit more into the story of the second season first. <laughs> oh, just the bro the broad strokes overview of the story. Just that uh, in the first season we saw a little bit of uh, the seer Madame Shibabawa in her prediction that you know a great calamity is going to befall the planet. You know. Um, and it's slowly starting to come to pass as the incidents with monsters is escalating. And there is the appearance of a man named Garo, who is utterly fascinated by monsters. And he basically 
he wants to make his presence known to every hero everywhere that he's the biggest, baddest, strongest uh, mother lover in the land. And that's kind of you know the broad strokes overview. There's little things in there we'll talk about in between. But uh, yeah, I I feel like a good way to describe this second season as a whole is one of my favorite descriptors that I don't get to use very often. It was aggressively average. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, I mean, it, it's, we got so used to, and, and, you know, obviously we can't pin down a single person on a production uh, crew, but it was obvious that Madhouse and Shingo Natsume had a clear vision for the first season and you know they consistently delivered on it for its full run and it was just amazing to behold every episode was incredible and then we come to this where they kind of were like uh okay we can phone it in on this episode we may go look a little bit on the next one then we can you know just kind of go back and forth between it's fine they won't notice except they will yeah and I mean, we've mentioned this before in the sneak peek when we talked about the show, and it's been all over the media, but this is not Madhouse working on this show anymore. It's switched studios. It's JC Staff now. You have heard John's criticism of JC Staff and some of his recent reviews. It's a little weird, though, because it's not a show I'm going to be talking about for a while, but or I'm not going to be talking about one of their shows for a while because they have several this current season, and I hope that, and that might seem like they're spreading themselves thin. Because they probably are. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the shows I'm watching has at least... More, has noticeably better production values than the show that came before it. Which may be a good enough huh. nod to <laughs> refer to what series it's from. But ever since maybe the first half of Food Wars 3, they were kind of, eh, you know, it still looks all right, but it's a little off here and there. Mm. And then it just sort of started to spiral real hard. And now it seems like they're kind of trying to pull it back a bit. I don't, I don't know. It's weird, man. And we're mostly, of course, we're mostly talking about the visuals here. You know, yes. you brought Food, uh, Food, Food Wars Season 3 as an example. And I really liked the story of that. And I still thought everything... You know, aside from the visions, was really good in that season. And the same can be applied to One Punch Man, in my opinion. I mean, mm -hmm. partly. I feel like some of the jokes really needed the snappy editing and snappy visual presentation to, like, to get maximum, like, the maximum effect out of them. You know, some of the most funny stuff was due to how well and snappy it was presented in the first season. Like how well it was staged, how well it was directed. And you miss out on that here, too. But a lot of the dialogue is still great. A lot of the st story beats, as simple as they might be, are still good. Like, for example, I I like Garo. I, I think he's a cool guy, just in terms of I can relate to his plight that, you know, he, as a kid, was always rooting for the villains in the superhero cartoons. Mm-hmm. And he didn't understand why everyone was just rooting for the heroes, even when the heroes often didn't really do anything. They just appeared and punched a guy and then it was over. While the villains put all the efforts in their plans and, you know, really fought for what they believed in. And sometimes even had, like, noble motives in certain cases. And nobody could uh, else could see past that. They just wanted a hero and, uh, you know, wanted to root for the hero. And Garo didn't like that. And I gotta say... <laughs> that ring weirdly true for me because I often in certain movies in certain cartoons whatever I am also at least as a kid I rooted for the villains because I was like man that's <laughs> such a cool plan that's such a I love it I love a good plan I just mm, I love a good well thought out well put together plan especially because I'm really bad at that myself <laughs> I suck at strategizing I suck at strategy games holy shit fuck oh, me man. I can't play fucking StarCraft for the life of me. But, man, I love it. I love it when, a, when there's a clever, a v really clever, passionate villain who has a passionate cause, who might be wrongheaded in certain ways and is not 
employing the right methods and it's being too violent. But really, you know, it's going there and it's putting everything in together, put the crew together, and then the hero just for the sake of being his he a hero makes it all fall apart. And then I was sometimes like, I get, I know, th I know they're bad people, but <clears throat> I, I kind of root for them. I, so I had that moment, you know. Not only with this show, but without going to video game spoilers in the most recent expansion for FF14, where one of the guys who was clearly bad is like, you know, they, they paint him in this really sympathetic light. Like, yeah, he was trying to do he's trying to do this, but he's going about it the wrong way, man. Yeah. And it's still, when it all falls apart and the plan falls apart and everything falls to shambles and everything, you're like, yeah, I know I know this is the way it has to be, but it's still a shame. Yeah. <laughs> and it feels like Garo is coming from that uh, that thing and made that his raison d'etre. And he's like, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna become the monster that is gonna be better than all those heroes. And he's not He's beating heroes up left and right just because he can and because he wants to be the strongest. And that is clearly bad. But, you know, deep down, he's not really a bad person. You see that in his flashbacks with his, you know, his teacher, um, Silverfang. And you see that when he, he, um, he often in the uh, shows on many uh, episodes, he talks to a, a young boy who has like this guide, uh, this hero guide that um, uh, Garo is trying to lift some information from. And his interaction with the kid is really like heartwarming. He, you get the hmm. sense he really likes he likes he likes kids. He likes you know he sees themselves and the, uh, uh, himself and them. He's like, oh yeah, this is, was a simpler life and everything. And uh, he is not mean to them. Some snide comments here and there, but it's not like it's not like this demean. He doesn't have a demeaning way he talks to them. He's really like, no kid, get out of here and stuff like that. And it's gonna be dangerous. And he. He uh, gives them a pat on the on the head or uh, uh, on the head or something when you know when he's like, "Hey, thanks for letting me look at the guide and everything." <laughs> There's a good person under underneath all of that here, yeah. and that comes through. And I think the show does a really good job at bringing that across. I don't know. A lot of that is probably because it was in the manga, I guess. Uh, but still, I think I think uh, JC Staff did a good job at bringing. Garou's character across and make us sympathize with him on several occasions. I mean, they, you know, at least kept uh, one of the same writers going from season to season. Talking about Hiro Suzuki. So okay, right. they, they were able to, you know, keep that same sort of vision in the writing. Yeah. And like I said, a lot of the jokes are also still great, especially when it comes to fun dialogues and Saitama's reaction to certain things, because he still has this great... Pretty much unfazable, uh, nonchalant. Uh, I don't kind of, I kind of don't give a fuck way about reacting to things. Like he does in many, in many cases, things that are supposed to be super important and are treated like that to uh, by other people. He just either doesn't know about or he doesn't care about, and he has no problems with showing that, and not in an asshole way. Just like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. I don't really care. <laughs> Until he kind of uh, meets his match with King, as far as video games are concerned. Yes. <laughs> that is great. Their relationship is fantastic. I love King because he's supposed to be this, you know, the big seventh ranked S class hero. But he's, he's just, he's a fucking loser. He's and a I fraud. love it. <laughs> he's a super fraud. Yeah, he's a fraud. He's like, everybody thinks he's super strong because a lot of villains just run away from him. But the thing is, his special power is he emits a kind of menacing aura. That's why nobody dares to, to touch him. If they did, he, they would knock him out in one punch. And I don't mean Saitama would do that, but everyone would do that. Because yeah. King is just a guy that can can just, ha just has this very menacing look. And his fucking King engine, which is just his heart, which... <laughs> <It's> his <laughs> heartbeat becomes super fast because he's of co obviously stressed out and, and just fucking terrified... But every that just works in a way with the superpower that everyone is afraid of him. So that's fantastic. It's just a fantastic, another fantastic spin on heroes in this show. And I love it. It's so good. It's so and good. He's just a nerd. And he just wants to do nerd things. And then, oh, 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 I, I'm somehow a superhero now. Yeah, he doesn't want to be. But, you know, he also appreciates the benefits that come with that. In terms of, you know, money and everything. So, 
Yeah, but him and Saitama connect uh, just because, you know, he Saitama gets what he is and King understands what Saitama is and, you know, they both have uh, a passion for video games. King is just great A nerd and much better at video games than Saitama is, which I, again, could relate to uh, as well, especially when they played fighting games, which they do a lot, because <laughs> I have two friends that I played a lot of fighting games with and they are so much better than me. <laughs> and sometimes it's hard to keep my cool when I just, just whittle down their health in the fucking fighting game and just get so close to finally win one of them and then just they fucking kick my ass. And like, fuck, I was so close to winning. No. And this is exactly what happens in this show. In one episode, I was like, Saitama, I feel you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I like these guys, but I'm getting really angry right now, and I need to vent, and <laughs> because of my own own shortcomings. Yeah, but it's <laughs> it's great. There are a lot of stuff, a lot of relatable stuff in here. A lot of just from all different kinds of characters. You can find aspects of yourself in them, and you know aspects of other people in your life. I mean, Saitama doesn't really have to stand still in this in this series either. He is bummed because he can't grow anymore you know mm. we get some more insight we, there were some allusions to that in in the in the first season but uh this season goes more in depth when it comes to that he outright says to king i'm bummed i can't grow anymore i'm already too strong so my life has become boring and aimless um but he only considered physical strength as the most important trait of a hero and that's the only thing that he is like really really good at in other categories, he might be lacking, so he can improve in that and, you know, evolve. And that is what King tells him, and that is some food for thought that he gives him and helps him look at things differently and, you know, get have, like, this uplifting moment between those two. And Saitama will be like, oh, yeah, maybe not everything is, like, hopeless for me, and maybe not everything is aim aimless and boring in my life. And, you know, of course, because King is the fraud that he is, he stole this monologue from a fucking manga. <laughs> Which is also perfect. <laughs> and I loved it. So, yeah. Um, all that stuff, you know, is great. Some of the scenes, definitely, you know, some of the comedic scenes as well would have profited from having more quicker edits and being, you know, having more impactful edits and having more impactful presentation and stuff like that being faster, quicker, snap, more snappy, everything like that. But the emotional component, the character development component is still strong in this one. If you if you were in if you were not only into One Punch Man season 1 for the uh visual panache and uh the visual candy, but also for the characters and the character development, there is still something in this second season here and something to enjoy and something to to, to watch the series for, which which I was really relieved to find out because I wasn't sure about that in the beginning, like in the first two episodes or something. It's like, uh, is there going to be enough in here? But then, you know, they did the stuff with Goro and the relationship between King and Saitama. And, you know, Genos has some stuff too, who is still the best, best boy in this. Everything <laughs> that he does is fucking awesome. And... Also, funny as hell, you know, because he wants to support his sensei. He wants to support, uh, support Saitama. With, uh, and he does... Sometimes he draws the wrong conclusions from certain, certain things. Like when Saitama is like... I don't I don't even know why he is depressed. But uh, Genos thinks that's because Saitama is bald. <laughs> and calls <laughs> his fucking, fucking dog... The doctor that gave him the cyborg parts. And like, hey doctor, you talked about this these implants recently. Can we do that now? <laughs> And Saitama was like, no, that's not what this is about. God damn it, Genos. And then when he, uh, Saitama was at the uh, tournament, because there's an actual fighting tournament in this show, you know, mm. Shonen Trade. Uh, I didn't expect it to come to One Punch Man, but it does. Even though, of course, it plays out differently than in any other Shonen show as well. But when, I don't know, when uh, Saitama wins a, a fight or something, like the only one getting up and clapping like super hard is fucking Genos. And it's great. I love it. So yeah, all that stuff is good. All that stuff is great. What is not great is, as John said, is the overall visual presentation in the show. Sort of lacking the heart of the first season. And that sort of, you know, makes some... It sort of takes away the impact of certain scenes. I mean, I will say the giant centipede monster that uh, showed up several times, 
the CG on that looked fine, actually, compared to when you compare it against, you know, everything else that was going on around I, it at, at certain points. You know, that that monster looked, you know, really good and intimidating and Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> It, that yeah, I would have mentioned that too. Thanks for doing that. Um, the uh, yeah, I actually thought the CGI on that was great, and I'm a harsh critic of CG in anime. But uh, yeah, the, the CG on that thing is fantastic. It's super fluid. It doesn't never feels like it's like cut frames un unless it needs to. It's just it's it. it brings the um, enormousness of that creature across well and how it moves and everything feels realistic. It's fantastic. It's it's great CG. It's really well done. I can't believe I say that uh, I'm able to say that. But yeah, good stuff. And in general, this might be one of JC Steph's best looking shows just in terms of pure animation quality on certain episodes. Just mm -hmm. what they have done. For example, uh, the fight between Garo and the A-class heroes pretty much at the end of the show and later him against Genos, is really cool. Like, there are a lot of cool fucking moments in that, well-animated moments in that uh, in that scene. Like, in terms of choreography, uh, action choreography, in terms of hand-to-hand -hand combat, in terms of how the heroes do teamwork and employ their specific traits to empower each other and to help each other and to maximize their, their potential and everything to fight against uh, Gar Garo's, like, incredible battle prowess. And then Garo trying to find a way to outmatch Genos, which is a really tough thing because he, Genos is kind of OP <laughs> in regards to Garo's power level and everything. And all of that, in my opinion, looked great. The problem is, you automatically, if you've watched the first season of One Punch Man, you automatically compare to that. Yeah. And then it can only lose because the first season looked so much better. <laughs> And that might be unfair, but that's how it is. And a second season of a show, especially a second season, doesn't exist in a vacuum. And when you have this ex excellently put together first season in terms of visuals, that has like a fucking mind-bending, groundbreaking animation sequence in every, every fucking episode, sometimes several in each episode, then this loses out. This looks weak. It's not all in the details. Like, I think it's the baseline. Just the baseline animation quality is just not as high. But it's also really a lot of moments slash the, the flavor, the panache, the details. For example, something I really miss that isn't in there anymore are these flashy eye catchers. I don't know if they oh. maybe work out all in the streaming, but first season of One Punch Man had that. Like, you get a flashy animation bit from the episode uh, or you know a character from the episode and then with some really cool color splashed on that simple simple color design simple silhouettes and then after the break you get the same thing just with different colors and i thought that was really cool and really matched like the comic booky feel the show is trying to go for yeah like the classic sta u.s superhero stuff that fit really well that. yeah and that's not in the second season i don't know if that got cut for streaming or whatever, maybe it's in the TV broadcast. But yeah, it's not in here. And I noticed that. It felt like, okay, this is this is something that the second season does worse than the first one. And there's so many moments in this show that feel kind of lazy. That feel mm -hmm. like either not the maximum amount of effort uh, was put into this, or the people behind the show just were not capable of it, be it of time restrictions or lacking motivation or, you know, just being not as good as the job as the people in the first season, you know? Talent is a thing. And some, I don't know, some maybe there are a lot of newcomers working on this uh, second season when compared to the first one. And you had some more veterans and more, you know, capable people in the first one. Uh, I always feel bad when talking about this because I'm not able to draw for the uh, picture for the life of me. I can do stick figures, and that's that. So criticizing people who do stuff I could never dream of doing <laughs> always feels like, oh god, yeah, well, I. Mm. But I can criticize it in terms of what I'm seeing and what other people that were also capable of doing things that I could never do, but could then do them even better than the people from the second season in this case. 
And I think that's a valid argument and a valid attack angle when it comes to criticism. And yeah, that's that's what what I'm going for here. Because on its own, if the first season was done by this crew, by, by this second season crew, I think nobody would comp have complained about the second season. Mm -hmm. I think people would have probably liked the first season where they said, hey, this is a really good shonen action show with some really funny scenes, cool characters, everything. It's really cool. Like I'm going to I'm going to keep watching this. People would have done that definitely. I think it would maybe not have had such a giant ass mass appeal as the first season did, but it would have found a lot of fans and a lot of people would have said this is a great looking show. But the first season looking like it did and the season 2 looking like like it does, it feels like a step down. And that is sad. Because, like I said, there's enough in the second season that is really fun. And I think, I think you, I, I don't know, John, what is your overall feeling on the show? Did you get, at the end of the show, did you feel like, okay, yeah, this was a worthwhile wa a watch. The visual stuff was, was definitely, definitely, definitely not on the level of the first season. But they, they did what they could, or it felt like maybe they did what they could, what they were capable of in most cases. And there are some enjoyable scenes in there. And, you know, the writing holds it over water for most of the time. Or did you feel like, no, this, mm, this was so lacking in certain parts that it just, like, took me out of the episode? I mean, I feel like that, were, that there were moments that kind of pulled me out a little bit. But, you know, it, it kept me going by virtue of, you know, I wanted to see where it was going. Um... I, I will say I think it's weird, you know, obviously more there's more than one weird thing about this production, but it's weird that there was the such a large gap of time between the seasons because yeah. when Munch Punch Man came out, it was hot, it was big. And then, oh, here's your second season. Four years later, like I feel like for however m Whatever amount of money Bandai Namco threw at this, because they were a big funder in this, I feel like they would have, you know, seen the value in going at it a lot sooner and maybe trying to keep the, you know, trying to do whatever they could to keep the original crew on there. But for, I don't know if they just went with like the lowest bidder or something. You know, the, the, these are details we'll probably never know, or we'll or we'll find out in like. 10, 15, 20 years, someone will, you know, feel, yeah, now is the time to talk about it. But like you've been saying, the the writing is there and that's what kept me going. But just the disconnect between the visuals sometimes. But, you know, I will say it was apparent they saved their budget for the final episode because, damn. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> they put their all into that one. It was, the thing is, the final episode looks like, Every episode of season one looked. Yeah, and I maybe, mean, maybe, maybe <laughs> season one looked even better than that. Yeah, so. and, and I mean, we were sort of breadcrumbed along the way there because you know there are other like flashes of brilliance along the way, mm -hmm. and then I don't really know going to the ending of the season if they really earned the right to tease a third season the way they did because you know. I would really hope that they, if JC staff are still working on it, if indeed it does get another season in four, six, ten years, <laughs> hmm. um, if they're willing to put in a bit more of an effort, or if, you know, Bandai Namco looks at it and says, yeah, maybe we should shop around a bit more instead. You know, again, we won't know the business side decisions on that for. A long, a long, long while. So, and maybe, like, maybe they get part of the original crew back from season one because they are not occupied with other stuff. I mean, you said you were wondering why they waited so long, and there are many reasons that could be the case. I mean, maybe the source material hadn't progressed far enough, and they were just out of material and saying, "Okay, we're gonna wait a while," and when they had enough. You know, the original crew wasn't available and they were like, okay, okay, we're going to wait a bit. And, you know, then they couldn't make it work. And then they decided, no, we're going to we're gonna kick this into motion because otherwise, like you said, 
this brand is going to lose more popularity and nobody is going to watch this anymore, which is what happened to Attack on Titan. Like mm-hmm. they waited an incredibly long time between first and second season as well there because the manga was not pro- had not progressed far enough. And Attack on like- Titan first season was a fucking phenomenon. Like that shit was everywhere, just like One Punch Man. And I mean, Isayama said in so many words, I don't want filler in the anime. Yes. Which which I commend. That's great. And then he also made cuts to his own work to make the show, you know, more digestible, which again is great, you know, that he had that creative input. Yes. But, you know, and we haven't really touched on it yet, but we're going to pr- maybe run across the same problem with Attack on Titan where it may end up in other hands other than Wit Studio. Maybe, yes. And the, the apparent problem what already happened to Attack on Titan was that it's popular to evade. Like, not nearly as many people watched the second season as the first season. Like, mm. people just forgot that it existed and didn't pay attention anymore or they didn't care anymore. And that's what happened. And I'm pretty sure that the people behind Funny One Punch Man, the anime adaption, at some point were like, we must do something with this franchise now or it's gonna, we we will not be able to make enough money with it anymore. So that's probably, or, or I think, I wonder if that's the case, but I can assume that this might have been the case why that thing was maybe rushed into production at this point. Why they didn't wait for Shingo Natsume uh, to be free again, why they didn't wait for the other people to not be occupied with other stuff. They wanted, they needed One Punch Man season two to exist now, and yeah. they were willing to um, to compromise. I think that was a bad decision. Mm. I, you know, putting another year between, we have waited so long, <laughs> <laughs> putting another year between season one and season two, two wouldn't have mattered if season two would have looked like season one did. At least enough people would have been on board. I don't think it would have mattered in the long run. Uh, and I think more people would have been happy with that because that show, second season, got a lot of negative buzz before it aired even. Like a lot of people who saw the trailer were like, wait, this looks like Luster. This looks like like they are not the, not having enough budget or they're not the right people on this or what is happening. Like enough people have done videos on this, enough news uh, sites have reported on this that... From the first trailer alone, this looked off. This didn't look right. And when when that is the first reaction to get uh, you get for your second season of a show that was fucking popular as hell, maybe overthink. Like, I mean, at that point it was already too late, obviously, because production was probably progressed far enough along that they couldn't just you know put a full stop on that. But mm. you know, maybe learn f- for the future from that. Well, just remember, in general, I remember the first few uh, ads were just still frames or like frame or you know like a few small movements and it was like and and at that point i think a lot of people understood well if you're not willing to show us then maybe it's not there (laughs) yeah that's like uh going back to um when i talked about the very ill-fated second season of senran kagura and the first pv that came out looked fucking terrible like Mm. that's not what you want to show in your pv my dudes yeah and you know apparently i feel like the way they did with one punch man was at least a little more strategic so we could see oh yeah this is how the characters look in the second season everybody (laughs) but you know we're, we're showing you just enough to get you interested but not enough to be like Oh, to, to, we're not going to drive you away before it starts airing. So, you know. Yeah. It's, huh. it's just, it's a shame. I mean, I was really looking forward to a One Punch Man season two, not this One Punch Man season two. It's this weird sort of, I don't know if bittersweet is the right word, but, yeah. you know, because the quality of the writing in, it is there, it's just everything else encompassing it you know for people who don't who who are there for the action the brrr, that'll push them away immediately which is unfortunate maybe not you know not imme- maybe not immediately i think there will be enough people out there who i don't want to say don't even notice the difference maybe subconsciously they will but who will like yeah the action show is all right blah 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 but you know if you are a big fan of the first season and then you go into the second season without knowing 
that switch studios and everything and creators even then you should be able to notice a difference mm. uh some people probably won't but i think most people will but still i think there are enough people who enjoyed the second season i'm pretty sure there are um it's just like i i watched the first season at least three times all the way through i fucking loved it and all i could do for example, in this season, uh, during the fight between Saitama and Suryu in the tournament, the final fight of the tournament, I was imagining what that fight could have looked like with the Season 1 team at the helm, and it bumped me the fuck out, like, from beginning to end. All the shortcuts they used, man. all the fucking still frames, everything. It's like, man, if that... If Suri, this wa- Suryu, like, looked off model so often, too. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, stuff like that, you know, the, yeah, off-model characters and just still frames instead of uh, uh, animations, like minimal animations, like p- talking heads and, you know, just character models just moving across the screen without motions. You get a lot of stuff like that. The new opening looks really lackluster in com- p- comparison to the first one, in my opinion. I mean, mm. it's nice that they're trying to go for a more comic book style as well, but that's also, like, it feels like, no, it doesn't feel like it has the... I don't know the, the the power, the grandiose feeling that the first first season's OP has, uh, like with this gi- these giant monsters looming over Saitama. And the second season OP feels like your fucking bare standard anime OP with not much creative force. A lot again, a lot of just character silhouettes, character names throwing on screen, blah 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 blah. Here are your story beats. Here's what's gonna happen, but nothing nothing visually impressive. Uh, while the first one had Sakuga moments up the ass. Mm. And yeah, that's a shame. And the weird, the weird thing and the kind of sad but funny thing is how well that kind of lackluster presentation resonates with some of the themes in the second seasons, especially when it comes to King. Because if you remember, in the first episode, Saitama asks King if he is fine with lying about being a true hero. You know, it feels like this show is a fraud as well. A bit like that that really fits king's character uh in in the second season and it feels like the second season when you compare it to the first one feels a bit like a fraud as well not i'm not trying to be mean it's just like it pales in comparison it feels like uh i don't know a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy that has lost a lot of its color and uh resolution and everything yeah come for the Come for the story, come for the characters, come for the uh, dialogue, everything, for the jokes. But definitely don't stay for the visuals if you were a giant ass fan of the first season like I was. Mm. It's still fine in its own right. There, like I said, there's good action stuff in there, definitely. But it doesn't come close to Attack on Titan, to One Punch Man Season 1, definitely not, mm. uh, to My Hero Academia. Uh, any of those shows nothing nothing like that is in this show anymore or even to the ad- adaption of one's other work mob psycho definitely oh, don't know no, don't even go not even close not even uh not even remotely no i think this is still a good show i think this is still a fun show i enjoyed watching it most of the time when you know i could blend out what the first season looked like it's enjoyable. I would still like to see where those characters go. Uh, go. I would still like to see what's going to happen from that moment on in the story. I would have just liked to have seen it rather with the team behind the first season. Mm. And that's all. Um, if you're still inclined to check out the second season, and, you know, there, there's moments worth checking it out for. I think we can agree on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can watch it on Hulu. You can watch it on Viz's website, apparently. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, apparently you can watch it on Crunchyroll, just not in America. Yeah, it might be on Crunchyroll over here. I'm not sure. Yeah. I have to look that up. But yeah, it's recommended. Check it out. Uh, there's still enough in there. Just temper your expectations. Mm hmm. And that is a wrap on the 78th episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our shows from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jack Kaufman. Please go to vit.bandcamp.com and check out his awesome work. 
Our show is available on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting enemybraintrees.com for our review index and more. Leave us comments and questions on YouTube, follow us on Twitter at AnyBrainFreeze, or send an email to AnimeBrainFreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in, we hope you had a good time, and please join us again on our next episode. Macht's gut! So long, everybody. Next time on Anime Brain Freeze. The rise of a hero? And let's have ourselves a bizarre adventure in Italy. Italy.